music because it brings people into my life and it introduced me to people. There's one young lady that was missed that we didn't say anything about. We spoke about my wife, my daughter, my niece Sharon, and there's a, another young lady who helps me all the time because without a team, you cannot do anything. And I want to thank Pamela, my niece here, you know, to uh, it's like having a band, you know. I play the drums, I don't play the piano and bass and all that stuff. So, well, teamwork, man, nothing really works. Uh, we're going back in my life, man, where you see all these great people. I had the opportunity of uh, uh, meeting so many of them, you know. And uh, I come from, born and raised right here in Pittsburgh on the north side. And what I, what I had in my life, you know, as a little boy, at the age of uh, very little, I had two brothers, Norman and Lawrence, who were musicians. And being that, you know, you come from a little small house, uh, in the living room with my mom and dad, like, that was their bedroom, you know what I mean? So, therefore, everybody would go to school, and my two older ones be practicing. I, I, I tend to think sometimes, because I would lay on the couch, you know what I mean? At the age of three and a half years old, while they would be having Dakota State and anybody be in the house practicing with them. And I seemed to think many times, I said, man, maybe all that music just went through my head at the age of three and a half. And by the time I got to four, I was in down there playing with the kindergarten kids with Miss Skoda because I couldn't go to school until I was five, okay, in kindergarten. But at the age of four and a half, I was at Mary Jane College School playing with the little kids' orchestra. And one of the great things for me in my life is support. My family supported me. My, you know, my teachers supported me. And my, my dad had two older brothers. Well, two younger brothers, I'm sorry. His name is Frank Humphreys and Hildred Humphreys. And both of them played um, instrument. My uncle Frank, they call him Fat Man Frank Humphreys, but he's a big dude. He played the trumpet and he played with everybody. Everybody, my uncle held it with the same way they play with everybody. And then they moved to New York City, okay? So after they moved to New York City, uh, families started having family reunions and everything, okay? Before I realized it, I was in, uh, I was in Atlanta, Virginia High School when Illinois Jacket heard me play, and he had to come to Pittsburgh and play at the Crawford Grill. And he asked me to, to come there and play, and that's the first time I got struck by the musician union. <laughs> that didn't want to give me a problem until the club owner, Buzzer Robinson, said, you better not mess with this kid. <laughs> and so they let me play with him because I wasn't able to join the musician union. Then after that, going to high school, I sat in with Stanley Turrentine and Miss Shirley Scott, okay? And uh, they were at the hurricane. <laughs> and it's so funny, man, after sitting in with them, they came over to my house where my, where my parents were and they said, we would like for Roger when uh, he get out of school in June to go and travel with us. And I was so very much thrilled. But at the same time, we were going back and forth to New York City because that's where our relatives live. And that's where I did my first tour on the road with Stanley Turrentine. And it was so wonderful, man, at the age of uh, 18 to go out on the road and he taught me so much. And I'm trying to put all this together for you in the few minutes that we got because it's much longer than that. <laughs> much longer than that. And I don't want to forget anything. So after doing the trip with uh, Stanley Turnting, uh, I used to go to the Crawford Girl all the time to hear Horse Silver in the band. So I was introduced to Horse Silver and uh, with his band and right after I played with Stanley Turnting when I was 18, I get a call back I get a call two years later from Horace Silver. People recommended my name, okay? Get that young kid, Roger Humphreys in Pittsburgh. Get him to come up to New York and audition for the band. Well, I was petrified, because they had so many great drummers there, man, until I almost shook to death. I said, dear God, I know I can't get this gig. But it wasn't the fact that I was greater than these other drummers. It was that the fact that I was fitting what he wanted me to play, okay? <laughs> And like being young, and that taught me a whole lot, you know, it's about you playing with the group. My ego tripping, out playing the group, you know what I mean? Playing louder in the band. And when you go on the road with people like that and when they're very kind to you, they teach you a whole lot. 
and this is why they 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 gave so much to me, and that's why I'm giving back to the young people that I have in Pittsburgh. And those experiences helped me when I started at Kappa High School with my very good friend, uh, Harry Clark, invited me to come over there to teach. And it's, uh, it's really, when kids believe in you, you know, and your attitude is right by them, you get so much out of them, you know what I mean? When you can't convince them. Many times, some of the kids came to me trying to do a five-stroke roll, and I said to myself, ooh, ooh, and everybody else saying, this kid ain't got it. But when you're patient, and keep supporting somebody before you realize that a five-stroke roll get better, seven-stroke roll. It's about support, and you don't have to be the greatest, you know. And I tell them that all the time. Don't worry about being the greatest, you know. There's not just one greatest in the world. God created all of us, and I would be jealous if he only liked you more than he liked me. So if you're just one of the great drummers or, you know, musician in the world, you're doing a good job. But a lot of these pictures that you see right here, uh, I uh, heard about these people in my life through my uncle, Hildred and Uncle Frank, and uh, had the opportunity when I was with Horse Silver, uh, he, was, he was like, stayed at West Park, and uh, not, uh, not West Park, but the West part of uh, Central Park, and then I was staying with him, and all of a sudden, who gets on the elevator is Duke Ellington. I said, God, man, I never met that man before, so he introduced me to Duke Ellington, I said, well, what a giant. And just like you see uh, Earl Gardner, Ray Brown, I had the opportunity of meeting all these people, a few of them that I never met because they're much older than me, but they are the support of what jazz is in the city of Pittsburgh. And just like my man Joe Negri, he's such a beautiful person. Not only can he play, but he's a nice human being, man. And look at him. He's been on Mr. Rogers' show, you know, he done it all as a musician. And believe it, a lot of times people will tell you when you're young, I don't know why they want to be a musician. They're not going to make any damn money. <laughs> it's the passion that you have. You got nothing to do with money. It's your passion. And if you believe hard enough in what you want to do and treat that as a business, yes, you can make some money. And nowadays it's so helpful. Before we were trying to sell some CDs on the street. Now you got CD baby trying to send me a check. <laughs> and they got people downloading nine cents, <laughs> China, Japan, all over the world. And, and I give so much credit for the people who, who are taking this over to help us as musicians because every penny helps, you know. Every penny helps when you're a side man, and especially for some of the young students that I met to go to Duquesne and Pitt University. And the encouragement part is very great. Now, George Benson and I, we came up together as young men and I, I remember a guy by the name of Joe Westray had, had a place on Lincoln Avenue. And my brother would take me, because I was only in high school, would take me there on the night when Joe Westray had a jam session. And Georgie Benson was playing guitar, because he was in high school too, and I was playing the drums. We have such great memories, you know, coming up in Pittsburgh. But Pittsburgh is a rock for jazz when you see all these people. It's so much uh, have done for me. Because when you go at the, uh, on, uh, let me see, Wally Avenue, they built a new building up there. And I could not believe, you know, to see my name on that building with all these beautiful musicians who come before me and who set the legacy, you know, so I have something to grow on. And there's my Uncle Hilda, my Uncle Frank, right there. And, if, and what is so great about this, you can look these people up on the internet. I mean, you couldn't do this before. You can look them up and you say, he's telling a lie. Look that man up. <laughs> and now, this is my older brother on this side, Norman, and the other, the oldest one is Lawrence. Now, he played the saxophone, and Norman was the one who taught me how to play drums. But when he was teaching me at the age of um, four and five, they took me to a man by the name of Mr. Hellman. Hellman and he was down on Penn Avenue. And they took me down there at Wynn Marcellus and Harry Clark. But when they took me there, they wanted me to get some lesson because Joe Harris, one of the famous drummers who passed away in Pittsburgh, and when they took me there to the man to get some lesson, he heard me play a little bit and he said like, uh -uh, don't mess with this. Let him play from his heart right now and then understand to be able to interpret music. Because when you got a talent, you teach people how to read so you can interpret. That don't mean you're a bad musician. 
you you can only play what's on the paper, but when you got a gift, you play from your heart. And as a kid, I would listen to all this music and all the records, and I would know all the tunes. And when we see the thing, they gave me a doctor degree. I still don't know what the hell that's about. <laughs> <laughs> but when people love you, they make you doctors. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it's my friend, and, and I'm telling you, the young, I love him so much, old Jamie Moore. <laughs> but this one, be a picture when it come up uh, with uh, Ray Charles. And you're talking about an experience, man. That was a beautiful experience. I don't know if you ever seen the movie with Ray Charles. He was on there and like he was going to rehab and everything. And he learned how to play chess so very well, okay? So when we would travel with Ray Charles on the airplane, there was uh, Fred Robinson, the guitar player, and me. I would be the one who played chess because the other guys didn't play chess. So, I didn't realize this, like I said, until after I saw this movie. And I was wondering, every time I sit down with Ray Charles, you know, he have a pen board, and he set the pens in it, you know. And I would say, uh, he beat me this time, but next time I'm going to beat Ray Charles' butt, man, playing chess. I never did. <laughs> but later on, I seen the movie. He could play the heck out of chess, man. I was a beginner thinking I'm going to beat him. But one of the things I loved about him, uh, when I had the audition with Ray Charles, and I was called... Uh, Edgar Willis, he was the bass player at that particular time. He said, our drummer's leaving, and I suggested you, Roger, come and take the audition with Ray Charles, okay? So I went down to Roosevelt Hotel, and like I waited till he came out, and they introduced me, the drum set was there, and uh, they brought the music out, okay? And when they brought the music out, I looked at the music, and I said, uh, hey, man, I can't read this stuff. So... My man, I said, okay, don't worry about it. So, Ray Charles said, take the music away. So, he started playing the tune, and I knew the song. And he stopped playing the song. He said, let's play another one. And he played another song. He stopped playing that one. So, he said, let's play one more. But everything that he played, I knew because I listened to him every day almost of my life because my family loved this man. Music is inside your brain, not on the side of a piece of paper. But because of the fact that I had the opportunity of working with Harry Clark to go to the Creative Performing Arts, I didn't want none of my other students that I was teaching to misinterpret why you don't read. You must read to interpret what he's writing down on a piece of paper. You may not like what he's doing, but if you can read what he's writing down on a piece of paper, you can interpret what he's doing and make music out of it. Now, I said, hey, Harry. He said, I want you to teach at the school. I said, hey, Harry, <laughs> I can't, I don't really remember. What am, what, what am I going to teach the kids? He said, you're going to teach them whatever you got. What you know, Roger, that's what I want you to teach the kids. And it's a funny thing that happened in life to me. My first year I started there, you know, I was struggling through me reading stuff, you know what I mean? And this little young boy was his last, he was, he was a senior, and he was playing the timpanis. And him and I started playing the timpanis because I could read a little bit, I could, you know, interpret a little bit. And I got so much out of this kid, him and I, helped me to start reading more and more, and why it was so important for me to get my student to learn how to read. We know you got a gift, but you got to learn how to read to interpret the music that somebody writing on a pencil piece of paper, okay? And it, I mean, when you when you think about all the good things happened to me in my life, man, little Joey Sailors on the, the, the show at nighttime. What's the name of the show? Joey Sailors on, everybody? I mean, I thought the audience would know that. You know, Stephen Colbert, <laughs> the young boy that wear the cowboy hat that play the drum. Okay, but John, well, he's one of my students, and, then, and I had a gig that night when he went on television, okay, when they took him on TV. I had a, I had a gig that night, so when they announced everybody, his dad was in the audience, and they asked him different things, and what was so beautiful about him, he said, I'm from Pittsburgh, and I studied with Roger Humphreys, who's my teacher. And man, I wasn't home to see it, but it meant so much to me because you know, he gave it a dag on, you know, to mention my name, man. So, like I said, there's so many students out there now that I've been proud of uh, being a part of their lives. Until, that's why I had the thing, you may see it, it's called Pass It On. And uh, 
And what it means to pass on what I have to somebody else, you don't never know how happy it may make their life be. And we do a boat ride every year. This year is going to be, I'm going to tell you now so I don't forget, June the 28th. Put it on your calendar, please. June the 28th on the Gateway Clipper. And we do that. And what I like to try to do to encourage students, like I get three students every year, and we give them some money because they're getting ready to go to, to college. And a little bit, every little bit help when the kids are going to college. So that's something that I've been trying to do. And, and right now, we have a, a governor's award that they give me. I was asking my wife one day, where is all this stuff coming from? You know, like, damn, good thing you're trying to stay straight because you'd be in trouble, you know. Uh, if you don't, because they got cameras on everybody. Now, Earl Father Hines, my, my uncles knew him. And, you know, but dear God, my father was born in 1900. So you think about the history of all these people my people knew before. And I used to wonder a lot of times, <clears throat> how these people know me? Well, you're about this high. These people knew you from your relative. You know, when you walk into a place, you'd be wondering, how they know me? Well, your uncle told me about you, kid, that you can play. I said, wow. Now, Art Blakey, the one that they showed a minute ago, Art Blakey was a very good friend with my Uncle Frank, Uncle Hildred, because when my dad moved from Kentucky to come to Pittsburgh, had to be in the, say, in the 30s, okay, when they came. Well, my Uncle Frank and Uncle Hildred, they both came and they brought my grandmother there, okay, to Pittsburgh. They lived on the opposite street. So Art Blakey, Roy Eldred, my Uncle Frank and Uncle Hildred, they used to play together. You know how guys have jam sessions? And they used to play together right there on the north side before Art Blakey took his venture back in the 30s and moved to New York, just like my uncles and did, you know, uptown New York City in Harlem. So once again, Art Blakey knew me before I even knew him. But the thing about it, one of the things they always told me, whatever you do, son, because they were very beautiful people, they said, whatever you do, pass it on pass your stuff on to the next person so you can help the next student come alive and do what he got to do. So anyway, uh, right now, I've been doing the boat ride. I've been teaching very seldom because some point of life, you got to take a break, you know what I mean? Because I say it all the time, this is not a rerun. And I'm fortunate I made it to 76 now. I always want to play it because it keeps my mind together when I look out into the world to see how beautiful it is, the world that we're living in. And then I look into the world and see how crazy it can be. But my scapegoat is on the bandstand. And once I get on the bandstand, I just say, well, thank you, God. The world is beautiful after all. Because, when you, you know, when, when people listen to music, oh, man, it just radiates so much love. Last night we was at Con Arma, and it's a very small place. But to see the youth in all the different races of people, I said, dear God, this is a beautiful world. And what I would like to do now is find more students that I can not always teach myself, but find a way to get some of these kids some help. Because like Joey Seller and many other kids that I taught, helped them out, their parents had money. The lessons were $50 a lesson. We should have to have a way where it's, it's not about me making the $50, but giving the foundation to one of these kids where they can take their life in, into the world and do something. So this is one of the things I'm working on now to try to get a fundraiser because the musicians can't do it for free. They got to eat too. So get a fundraiser with some of the great musicians that I know who are a good teacher and a little bit of time can turn these kids out and they can want to go to college and maybe go to New York City just like, uh, you know, or anywhere around the world, like all the other great people. And that picture, man, was Teeny Harris. So you know that I'm not telling a lie. I was three and a half years old. Matter of fact, when he took that picture, I was in elementary school. I was at Mary Jane College School, and he took that picture because, like, uh, that's when, and if you can look real good, there's like a desk behind that picture, you know, on the side of it when I was a little boy. And um, the other pictures here, like my big band, always wanted a big band. It's just kind of hard to keep a big band going all the time. But I did a, a thing of Ray Charles 
because like I have so much of his music. But what I love about Pittsburgh right now is opening up. It's opening up, so there's gonna be more clubs, more nightclubs for people to go to in just a minute, because uh, we have uh, we have like I said, Con Armor, we have Stray Home where I play at, and there's a picture of me and Oprah. That was fantastic too, man. <laughs> <laughs> and you know she was so beautiful because I went there with Manchester Craftsman Guild to play on Oprah show, and like. Uh, you love it when you just have ordinary people. She wanted to show us around, okay? And she have staff, just like you all staff. And I said, I wish I could get a picture with her. And but the people we were with, they said, no, no. We all gonna get a picture together. And she must have overheard that. She said, what'd you say? Come on, get a picture with me, baby. I said, wow, that's interesting, man. You know, for people to just be so natural and so real, you know, how she is. And she is a, a very beautiful, sweet lady. Um, I don't know, I suppose to speak for about 20 minutes, but my language don't go, I mean, I'm trying to look at the, the pictures and talk to you about it. Now, do you, any of you have any uh, questions that you'd like to ask me? Not about money now. <laughs> any? How old were you when you were with um, Ray Charles? I was with Ray Charles, I'm trying to do my math, 26? Yeah, I think I was 26. That's pretty good, then. I was 26. No, you think that's funny. Keep on getting older. <laughs> I thought you left the keys. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. So uh, I heard, and you can correct me, that Ray Charles was very, very meticulous about his rhythm. And I heard he could be really, really hard on his musicians, especially his drummer. Mm -hmm. So did you ever encounter that side of him, or... No, I tell you what, I was fortunate. I, but I'm just saying fortunate, there's not no, you know, no ego trip or anything. I was fortunate that my rhythm was good, and also I paid attention. Ray Charles didn't direct with his hand when he said, Georgia, Georgia. <laughs> so you gotta wait till they come back. It ain't no rhythm. <laughs> you gotta pay attention. And that's how he directed. That's how he directed the band. Then, you know, he would lean. So he would give you, just I guess playing sports, you know, quarterback let you know what's happening, but he would let you know when the beat come, you know. So I paid attention and like, uh, I was fortunate, you know, I was fortunate, man, to have that in my background to teach me that. And that's why I love doing, we're going to do more music uh, of Ray Charles this year coming up with my big band. The last time I had my big band was only 10 pieces and... Uh, I couldn't afford any more, and we were down at the uh, Cabaret, Cabaret Theater because it was for New Year's Eve, and we were down there and had a good time, you know. But sometimes it's not affordable, and I don't like to do anything where I'm cheating musician because you know why? I know about being a side man. <laughs> I've been a side man, but he might have made $10,000, gave us each $50 a piece, you know, and to me that's unfair because you got to eat the same way. Next question. Yes. About your foundation, it's, it's going to be based here. Is it going to be national? Well, I may travel anywhere, but Pittsburgh is my home foundation. I said, thank you. I said a while ago when I was in New York City, man, you know, because I have a wife and uh, four children. And after being on the road a lot, you know, you have to experience the road is kind of rough. You'd be out there, you know, with your family and anything. And we're speaking about being with Ray Charles. Uh, my dad had a heart attack. And when you're with the band, they have an itinerary for you, okay? But the only thing that really got to me because of the fact that my dad had a heart attack, my wife was trying to get a hold of me. We were in Europe. And they said, well, we don't know where he's at. So that's a lie there, okay? Anyway, so it took about three days when she got a hold of me. I said, what? I don't believe this, you know. So, where I come from, I'm the youngest one in my family. And we speak up and tell you the truth, whether you like it or not. And I've never been afraid to be honest with somebody. So, man, when I found out, I was so, I was so angry until we stopped in front of Ray Charles' uh, hotel because we had to wait for the, the band boy to bring his luggage to the hotel to take it upstairs. So... You know, I said, man, I can't deal with this. 
So I got excited and I swore. I hope none of you own kids understand what swear words is. But I swore. And when I swore, the band man, the road man said, Humphreys, if you say something like that again, it's going to cost you a uh, $100. So I said, okay, would you chalk me up for $500 worth of that? <laughs> he ran off the bus. He ran off the bus to go tell Ray Charles, go Ray Charles upstairs in his room waiting for his luggage. Now we're side men, tired as hell, because we all got off the airplane. This is how life go. So when he ran off the bus to go tell Ray Charles what I said, I ran behind him, but he got on the elevator before I did. So I just watched the elevator go up on the floor, and when it got to the floor, I got on there, the elevator went up to the floor, and I could hear him talking, you know. I could hear him talking to Ray Charles for a minute, and uh, so I knocked on the door. He said, uh, who's that? And um, the, the band, <laughs> Don Briggs said, that's a Humphrey boy. He said, okay, Don, let him in. And I sat and I talked to him, you know. I talked to him, and like I was telling him what happened, you know. It made me uncomfortable, but my dad had a heart attack. Nobody said anything. He said, well, son, I'm sorry about that. Okay. Then I knew for a fact, because when you quit the band, you got to give them two weeks notice. So I had to figure out how long I'm going to be over here so I can go to Baltimore so I can quit the band that night, you know, so I didn't have to pay my way to fly over back to Pittsburgh. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, show you about how people are when they're real. We were playing that night because I, I put my notice in. And when we took a break, uh, he said, I want everybody to come back to the, the dressing room, you know, the green room. So we all came back here, and he, and he made me... He made me feel good because he said, one thing for sure, I can say, I got one man in the band. If things don't go his way or the proper way, if something happened, at least he will speak up and not talk behind my back. And I felt good because he was talking about me, you know what I mean? At the same time, my notice was in that that was going to be my, my last night there. But I had to be fair with Ray Charles because, like I said, he was nice to me. I didn't find nothing wrong with him. So he asked me when the, the music's over, he said, Humphreys, can you stay? I said, I already promised Stanley Turnton and Shirley Scott I'll meet them in New York City, Ray, because my time is up. He said, okay. He said, you have a good one, son. I said, thank you very much. And that's how I left my relationship. And it's beautiful when you can leave your relationship with anybody of being honest, you know, because his name is Ray Charles, not Jesus. And believe me, I'm saying it from the bottom of my heart. I don't respect nobody over the top of no bullshit. You understand? <laughs> I mean it. Because I want to be right and do you right. But at the same time, you know, you got to do other people right. And that makes us like a family. So, you know, that much for Rachel. Any more questions? <laughs> oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Uh, this is more about you than Rachel. Right. Okay. One of the things that he started off with was like, I can't tell you exactly the name. It was like, it was the blues one he always played. But 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 And it was the blues, and he did that. That's the test, man, to see where you at if you're paying attention. And then he played like the thing I told you, like Georgia. Okay, just to see if I was following him. I knew the songs because I heard them every day in my house, and like he played another one. And that was it, you know. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> Went back to his room. Two weeks later, I got the phone call. Come and join him in uh, Chicago, I think it was, yeah. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned Konama, Chela, and um, also thinking about, like, Pittsburgh had so many great venues that have closed, and like James Street or Proper Grill, and, and I'm wondering how sort of the, the racial and economic landscape of Pittsburgh has affected the music. Um, and places that have closed due to gentrification, how did that affect what was being played, who was playing? Well, when these things happen, how it affects the music, only kind of temporary because we are artists and we're very creative. So we're going to create a, a spot, even if it's in your basement. <laughs> we're going to find a place to play. That's what we do. Go, we love to play, and you feel like you got to play. But the thing about it, what you got to pay attention to now, you got to look into the future. Pittsburgh going to be something else. This is just the beginning. You got people moving in here. You got a lot of young people, different ages and everything. But it's going to be a different ball game in just a minute. And you got to have some kind of nightclub 
you got to have some kind of music around it so people can, uh, after you go to work, you can unwind, go somewhere. I got a very famous tune that I play by Stanley Turrentine, and the people love it. And when they come into my to the place where I'm playing at, it's called Let It Go. All that was bothering you that day when I played that tune, it's like them going to church. They say, oh, Roger, thank you so much. I don't know what the hell the tune does, but it's just the soulfulness of the music, and that's what the people like. So music is very important in, in all of our lives. So, and once again, I'm seeing different things happening in the area that is going to be quite a few uh, nightclubs. We needed this thing to happen. It's too bad that they all died out, but nothing lasts forever without the new transition of something else new happening. And some of you all now are making so much money, we can't wait to have <laughs> another, another nightclub going on so we can get paid. Yes, sir. Huh? What are some good spots now in Pittsburgh to experience some good jazz? Say, what are the clubs now? Yeah. Well, I mentioned like Con Armor also. I'll be down at Savoy this Monday. And, um, wait a minute. No, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm going to be in backstage. Yeah, well, backstage has something all the time. But when I say Savoy, it's on the first floor when you come in Savoy. Okay, and they're trying to do something like every Monday. Uh, uh, let me see. There's a few other places. The Market Square, huh? There you go. I played there. Yeah. And they're starting to get some uh, entertainment, some live entertainment. Uh, there's quite a few places, you know. And what I have to do is look on the list, you know, because there's some of the places that say, wow, I didn't realize it. It's just the thing about you got different places where they like different music and variety. CJ's was uh, very disappointing when they closed as well as James Street. There was a big establishment. People could come here and jazz, you know what I mean? So it broke many of our hearts. But in order to get the thing going, the nightclub owner had to be consistent. You gotta be in your personality to draw the people in. That's why I was talking to you about that little place called Con Armor. And uh, the place down on Smallman Street, we played there for some people, you know? And uh, uh, it's, it's fine. It's a fine little place, man, owners and everything. Any more questions? We gotta close it up, actually, so. Oh, man. <laughs> I just wanna say thank you so much for having me, man, all right? <laughs> it was our pleasure. Thank you so much, Roger Humphreys. <laughs>